Welcome to the Business Legends Podcast, where we interview business leaders and entrepreneurs so that you can learn from their successes, become inspired, and meet the people that make change happen. I'm the host of the show, Reese, and my co-host, Christian, is leaving me once again, but he has a good reason today. Um, we're actually on a flight this afternoon. He's getting everything prepared, so I'm going to give him, I'm gonna give him a, a little uh, little grace on that one. Give him a little grace. A little, little grace. Exactly. Just a little bit, though. Like, like <laughs> We can still talk smack about it on the show, just so Sounds you know. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> today, I'm accompanied by my good friend, Mercer Colley, with Colley Forsyth Law Group, uh, and they focus on immigration. And Mercer, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it, Reese. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Most definitely. So uh, let's jump right into it. So now, are you are you uh, Colley Forsyth Law Group or Colley Forsyth PLLC or Colley Forsyth Immigration or, or some mixture of the of the above? Or? Yes. Okay. We're, we're All the above. All <laughs> the above. So from a legal standpoint, we yep. are Law Group LLC, but mm-hmm. we are doing business as Colley Forsyth Immigration. Okay. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. That's all we focus on, so yeah. it started making sense to, yeah. to go ahead and do it that way. I, I'm going to give myself some credit. That was a really brilliant way to just, just plug your name in there as many times as possible <laughs> at the beginning of the show. So, so there you go. Um, so how, so I want to jump right into this, though. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different facets of law. How did you guys land on immigration, of all things? Because that seems like a crazy, especially in this area, area to practice in. Sure. Well, right after law school, I went and worked with a missions organization, so okay. which really made my family very happy. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finished law school, not going to go be a lawyer. Right. Uh, so with this, I was running an internship, but I ended up at probably 43 different countries. So Wow. Exactly. So you're just, you're, you're walking in, you're, you're meeting people, uh, different tribes, different groups. Uh, so it was... Now, where, where were you in... Like what? What a continent were you? Was it? Was it? You know, all, all the above. Them. Yeah, wow. um, <laughs> it's been a few summers in Africa, some in South America, Central America. Wow. Not as much in Europe. Um, a little in in the Middle East and a little in Asia. Wow. And so you're just missing Antarctica and Australia. It, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get to Australia. Yeah. Didn't get to Antarctica. Wow. But it was the experience was incredible. So after about five years, I was well. I want to get back into law. But I wanted to stay plugged into different cultures, and so immigration made sense. Yeah. I start. I, I had a buddy from law school. You know, it was Pete Rogers. He had a firm in Pittsburgh called Rogers and Rogers, and so I spoke with him, and we decided we're going to open a branch in Charlotte. So I was working for Rogers and Rogers, but it's it's kind of a strange dichotomy going on because I was working for them. But at the same time, I was the only attorney in Charlotte, so it's almost like being an entrepreneur for a firm that was already established. So it was, yeah. it was a really great experience. Uh, but that's how I got into immigration, was just wanting to, to stay plugged into different cultures and and just being able to, to help people that are coming to this country from other countries. That, that's incredible. I mean, it, it sounds like you, you took one of your life's passions and almost made a career out of it, like like at least in the facet that you operate within. I mean, would you agree with that, or is it something? I would. I, 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 I can't say that it was intentional. Mm-hmm. I kind of fell into it, but yeah. absolutely. I, being able to travel, being able to experience the things I did, I, I, there, there's no way I could do that now. Yeah. So the fact that I did that when I was in my 20s was just amazing. Um, and then that's where it came from, is yeah. this passion for, for different people from all around the world and different cultures. And so that's where it came from. And so I just kept going with it. It's... It's changed a lot now. Oh, I, can, I can imagine. So we were now, just talking before the, the show. Ball, yeah. yeah. It, well, yeah, and we, you know, we were just talking about before the show about how much has changed just in operating law. You know, I mean, nowadays right. sometimes you're doing Zoom calls to take care of things when before it may have been in person or on the phone or or even you know via snail mail or whatever else. Like, exactly. yeah. um, gosh, it's just it's just incredible to think about how much has changed. Um, I want to ask you an entrepreneurial question. Um, and it's just my own ignorance. I just have no idea, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't I don't practice in your area. But um, did you guys immediately identify Charlotte as an area that that had uh, room for immigration law, or, or was was that even taken into the equation, or is this just that anywhere you, you are can be immigration law type of thing? At this point, immig- immigration can go anywhere. Okay, and so it there were discussions about DC versus Charlotte. Uh, that firm in Pittsburgh had ties and connections to Charlotte mm-hmm. with family and those types of things. And so th- there was definitely a, a stronger push to get to Charlotte. At the time when it started, 
Charlotte was, had already started growing and was continuing to, to grow because this would, would have been around 2005. And so th there was enough going on that there was business for immigration. Yeah. Now, one of the more difficult things is I didn't focus just on business immigration. So we did removal, which is in front of immigration court. We did family. Well, the, there was a Department of Homeland Security office here, but there weren't any courts. So mm -hmm. anytime I went to court, I'm driving to Atlanta. Oh. Yeah. So that, that <laughs> was a rough three rough. years. There, there's um, a court here now, isn't there? There's or? a court here now. It okay. was established around 2008. So oh, for boy. three years, anytime I was doing court, it was in Atlanta. Wow. And so that was pretty rough. Oh man, <laughs> you, you, these are the things you take for granted it nowadays. Is, you don't is. even think. And I mean, now nowadays, I don't think that there'd be any reason for you to have to go to Atlanta for a for a case for the most part, right? Very rarely. Yeah. yeah. Be because it's immigration, I can mm -hmm. practice anywhere in, in the country. Oh, right? interesting. So I'm not, I'm not just pigeonholed to North Carolina or to Charlotte. Yeah. So I I have had some cases where, the client wanted me to do it, mm -hmm. and, but they were living in in Atlanta, so they would under the Atlanta court so I did have to go there and I had a case this past August where I had to go to Atlanta for the final hearing wow so it happened still wow but <laughs> most of it most of it fortunately I, I am in Charlotte yeah now. goodness gracious um it, here's a I don't know to, kind of off the wall question I guess but um you know when you're identifying when you're identifying Charlotte as an area that you want to practice um given that it's immigration do you do you investigate or do or, or did you investigate or do any research on you know, uh, immigrating cultures of the area or, or, or cultural significance or anything like that? Or was it just the amount of law that comes in, type of federal program or business or something like that? Or how did that work exactly? Right. We didn't necessarily look at, at which groups are coming to the United States and specifically to Charlotte. And the, the banking industry obviously mm -hmm. draws a lot of professionals. Yeah. And But Charlotte was growing right. so much. So there were a lot of people also coming for construction, for, for different aspects and different opportunities that were available in Charlotte. So it ended up being our clients a, a fairly wide mix of, of different types of cultures and different types of countries that they were coming through. Yeah. So it didn't necessarily look and say, okay, okay which which cultures are here and, and which which countries are, are infusing into Charlotte more than others. Uh, but it was just looking at Charlotte as a whole and saying that it is growing, and anytime you have growth, you're going to have immigration to the country, right? To that, the city. That that's that's kind of an amazing um, paradigm within within your specific industry, because you'd think that I don't know, for example, if if you're from Mexico or something like that, like you you may have a, a leg up with you know bonding and identifying with people that are that are immigrating from our southern border type of thing, you know. Um, but in your case, it was more the case of. Um, you know, the business attracts the immigration law and whatever type of culture, you know, you need to assist, you know, your, your practices within the law as opposed to towards that culture and things like that. Um, the reason I ask is because I've, I've met a couple of attorneys that, um, for example, I, I know an attorney that she's Russian and, and so she uh, ends up kind of bridging the gap between right. um, English speaking and Russian and things like that. Um, so I didn't know if that had ever come into play for you or if, or if that was just something that happens as a consequence it it does a bit mm -hmm. and my firm the way it's set up is I, I have a partner Jordan Forsyth mm -hmm. Jordan speaks Spanish oh cool um, everyone else in the firm speaks Spanish oh okay <laughs> my Spanish is I can function but yeah. I cannot practice law in Spanish okay. so I did not have that leg up for a bridge mm -hmm. and so what has ended up happening is that I would say 60 to 70 percent of our clients are um, Hispanic, so mm -hmm. they do speak Spanish. A lot speak English as well, but uh, Spanish is their first language for sure. Yeah. So we, I do have to bridge that a little bit, mm -hmm. in, in in that I need an interpreter a lot of times. But uh, most of our, most everyone else in our firm, I think, is one other person is fluent in Spanish, that they're able to, to speak with our clients if our clients need to have Spanish yeah. as the, the lead language. I was going to say, I mean, I, I would think that that might be like a competitive advantage of sorts when if when and if, you know, they're they're shopping around for, for firms or things like that, um, that, you know, you can relate to them on that, on that note. Um, sure. Have you ever had to, just out of curiosity, have you ever had to, you know, hire a translator or anything like that for something, whether it was Spanish or anything else? 
Sure. I mean, yeah. when it comes to consultation, so I'm speaking with clients, mm -hmm. particularly if it's a, a country where we don't have someone in the firm that speaks there, we, we do have to hire uh, translators to come in and yeah. interpret for us at times. Wow. And so uh, it's done by phone. Oh, uh, yeah, so sure. It's not sure. somebody actually physically coming to the office. But yeah, we, we do have to do that. Uh, the ones that pop into my head would be like Arabic. Right. Arabic is just not something that we have readily available in Charlotte, especially mm -hmm. within our staff. So that that is when we, we need to make sure we have everything completely accurate. Yeah. That we we do. We yeah. have to get an interpreter in to, to speak. That that's something that it's just one of those things that. Um, well, did you did you expect that that's something that you'd have to do when you started practicing law, or is that just that is that just kind of a given, or? I I did. Yeah. And like I said before, for years and years, I was traveling around right. the world. So I was always in a, a country. I won't say always. I was in a lot of countries yeah, where or, I was didn't speak yeah. the language. So right. it was always somebody around who in, would interpret. Yeah. And so actually, because of that, became very adept at using an interpreter. So, yeah. so the <laughs> timing can, of everything can, yeah, is, it's worked it's, out. It, it's, it's a skill that I, I've developed now. Yeah. And I... Even I, I was, I've told you before, I was had a radio show for two years, right? And I would answer all the questions, but every single question was in Spanish, so I had an interpreter there. Oh, it was nice. live radio, yeah. So I became very, very adept at using an interpreter, yeah. Kind of having a, an intermediary, you know, it, it's kind of some sometimes that can help you though, because it might give you a little bit of time to think it about, does. you yeah. know, like get prepare your answer or whatever. And um, I, actually, I had clients say that I, is I have one client recently who was. Spoke English very well, but asked for an interpreter. Yeah. In in court, for that very reason, is right. I can get my thoughts back together before I yeah. have to speak again. So. Well, I mean, you know, honestly, if, if English weren't my primary language as, as poorly as I speak it now, you bet I would want an interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you bet that I would want an interpreter for something yeah. like that, just to make sure that I was, you know, my T's were crossed and my eyes were dotted, type of thing. Um, and but, and when it comes to court, though, the court does provide an interpreter. Yeah. So, yeah. So, See, that, yeah. so that's there. Right. So yeah, it seems like it would it would they have to just in interest of justice and fairness, you know. Um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, business partnership and things. So you're you're I, I just recently got the opportunity to meet Jordan. Um, yes. And this mm -hmm. is about I don't know, two weeks ago, and you guys were celebrating your eighth. Is that right? Seventh. Seventh, seventh anniversary. We merged yeah. seven seven years ago in November, probably November first. Yeah. That's that's well. That's first off. That's incredible. Um, so what what has it been like navigating through that? Because before that you were basically practicing alone, correct? Right. Or you were a part of a firm with, or well you had the Rogers and Rogers, and then and you were mm -hmm. kind of individual, and then you kind of exactly yeah partnered up with Jordan. Right. So so how has that has that um, difference been in the last seven years? What types of things have you had to navigate? Yeah. So to, to your so I, I left Rogers and Rogers probably about 2011, mm -hmm. started my own firm, and then we merged five years later. Gotcha. And so. Well, let's let's start here. I'm sorry. Um, so, so first off, how did you meet Jordan originally? Was it in 2011 or was it? It was probably closer to 2013. Okay. Uh, we we both are litigators, so we enjoy being in court. Right. There was a continuing li legal education conference in D.C. So we knew each other before, but then we end up flying together. So we're sitting together talking. Oh, cool. Went through the whole weekend of. Of litigation, you know, best practices for, mm -hmm. for arguing in front of the court, and then we flew the whole way back, and we were just talking, and so it really spurred a friendship mm -hmm. that was based on immigration, but also that's interesting. It's kind of based on the you know subject based on, of what you were exactly. Yeah. But yeah. then we also uh, we were both members at uh, Charlotte City Club, so mm -hmm. we also had a social aspect there too. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, we we realized our, our firms were culturally very similar. Mm -hmm. And that the my core values, her core values, lined up really, really well. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we felt like well, the cultures are the same. Let's let's merge it and and see if we can branch into other areas of immigration. And so that's how it started. And yeah. it's been a it's been a great experience. And like we said, it's yeah, been seven, seven years. So and still going. Made it through COVID. Um, now we're we're both entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and so she was in. EO, which is entrepreneur organization, and mm -hmm. I was as well, and so, so we both had that aspect. You guys were just magically like you had a lot of similar 
interests exactly. and designs and things like that. So yeah, which which is great. Sometimes it can be it, it, that can also cause issues because sure. both being entrepreneurs, we both want to change everything and mm-hmm. and just give everybody in our firm whiplash from all the changes. Right. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's been it's been an incredible experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So what what types of things did you have to navigate when you originally merged? So original merged seven years would have been twenty sixteen, right? November twenty sixteen. Yeah. So you know you guys you guys have determined the, in my opinion, the most important piece, which is you know that the values align and and that you guys have share a common mission, common goal. What what happens next? I mean, when you when you sit down and you start talking about brass tacks, you know, I'm I'm sure that you guys didn't have any problems with your articles of organization and all right. that stuff. But, that was dangerous. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, you know, it's al- it's almost like you knew a guy. Um, but you know, what what types of things did you guys discuss? Like, and specifically, what I mean is, did you kind of divvy up the tasks, so to speak, when you when you merged, or what types of conversations did you have about that? Sure, a, a lot of our conversations and the growing pains dealt with processes. Mm-hmm. Is even though our cultures were the same, the way I would approach an immigration case, especially a court case, for instance, would be very different than how she approached it. Mm-hmm. And so that is that is one thing where we had to really sit down and go through processes and make sure that the processes were in line, that there was just one process and not two different processes going on at the same time. And so that, that was one, one area which I, I can't say that that happened overnight at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was probably two or three years later. Wow, we were still hammering out figuring out how to do things. things look like. Yeah, how how'd you get through it? I mean, you know, you think that I mean every every case is different. So you presume that you have, you know, even even if the subject material is similar, there's probably a, at least somewhat of a uh, uh, customized approach to something, right? Or or did you yeah. figure out how to standardize that? And we. Ended up standardizing everything, okay. but we would look at it and say, "Okay, this is this is how I would prepare the evidence. Mm-hmm. This is what the index would look like. And this is what we'd give to the judge. Then we'd look at this is what Forsyth used to do mm-hmm. before before we merged and say, "Okay, well, let's take the best practices. Let's figure out what works best." Was that tough? Don't lie. <laughs> sure, sure. Kind of, I mean, these these are your ideas. And right. Some of these it's like just your baby, and so having yeah. to say, "No, nah, okay, we'll we'll go the other direction." Yeah. But at the same time, we we both were looking at it and we said, "We got to do what's best practice." And right. So it was some things that were taken from either side and and merged into a a, a working functioning process. Yeah. Yeah. That's. It, it's so it's so interesting. I feel like I feel like all business partnerships in general have have, you know, that where they where they're figuring out you know process and things like that. And it's you know you take two people and and I would argue to say that as similar as you and Jordan are, you guys are both very very different people too. Absolutely. And yes, absolutely. Was, was you guys just out of curiosity were you guys as um, processes way different or were they similar and just different? Like I, I don't know how how to ask that, but to some extent. To some extent, they were similar mm-hmm. because anytime you're dealing with a family base, for instance, you're dealing with Homeland Security. So sure. Homeland Security has a list of things to say, okay, we Check need boxes. this, this, and this. And so anytime you're dealing with an immigration court, um, with the Department of Justice at that point, same thing is they have certain rules that you have to follow. Yeah. So th- but but everything some, else was <laughs> everything else was exactly a little bit different. Was, at least you have at least somewhat of a framework. Right. You know? So whether we just do a for instance, a checklist that just mm-hmm. has everything listed out or a checklist that has everything explained. So right. Those types of things. Yeah. But for the most part, it, there was a common ground just because we're dealing with the government. Yeah. Well, that and you know that probably helped you. <laughs> it did. It, <laughs> it, kind of, it, g- it gave you at least a skeleton of a framework to right. work with or whatever. Um, that's really cool. You know, um, how, how did you guys... So, you know, you're running a firm, and it's one thing to talk about the nature of work. We can always talk about that, you know, how to improve our, our own processes and our own, you know, the, the nature of what we do and provide a high-quality service. Um, how did you guys go about creating business goals? So whether it was, you know, the number of cases that you were doing or the number of things you were working on a, at a time or, um, you know, how many people you wanted to hire, like how did you guys go about creating that? Because you're coming from two individual firms, and so how did you merge those ideas together? A lot of that, I, I'm probably familiar with traction and mm-hmm. EOS and that. So that was and for for our listeners, those are how would you desc- well how would you describe those? I, I describe it as it's a 
it's a management system of how you can run your business. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, you get together once a year to have a, a really overall vision mm -hmm. and then get together quarterly to make sure that you're hitting that vision and, and putting together certain goals. And then in between that, you're hitting, you're, you're covering a, a weekly meeting to right. make sure that you're hitting the quarterly goals. Mm -hmm. And so from that, the, especially the, the annual meeting where we're, we're looking, we're saying, these are the goals. This is where we want to be at the end of three years, at the end of five years, at the end of 10 years, and then walk backwards to see what we need to do in order to get to where we want to be. Right. And so because of that, it, it drove itself to some extent of saying, this is how many clients we need, and in order to facilitate that many clients, this is how many attorneys we need, this right. is how many paralegals. Yeah. And so, so that it goes was back to that framework kind it of. Does. It does. It wasn't provided by the government. <laughs> Not by the government. Yeah. Sure. True. But it's the, the program. It's the sure. opposite of the government. Yeah. It's, it's organized and it's, it's in place. So, opposite is, of the government. That is, that is uh, too true. Oh, that's painful, but that's that's hilarious, though. <laughs> that, that's it. Um, that's great. And, and did you guys, um, you know, when you're, when you're having these meetings, um, you know, at least that provided some modicum of structure for you. Um, you know, did you guys did you guys ever have like a a big difference of, of vision with that like like in you know in five years I want to be here and then Jordan was like I want to be there type of thing or anything like that? Not necessarily in where we're going. Okay. Uh, ten, five, three years. Th there are some. Like, is is our focus? Should it be across the board? So right now, I, I, not a lot of fir uh, immigration firms do this, but we focus on everything mm -hmm. in terms of we do business immigration we do family immigration we do removal proceedings we see the government and federal court and we, and we do business immigration with companies and so because of that th there there's a lot going on and sure. so there have been conversations of do we want to cut business right not not cut business but cut right cut, cut a, business, a facet or whatever business like pieces that. those yeah. types of things mm -hmm. And so there have been discussions like that. And so so it's not, I wouldn't say disagreements in terms of where the vision is, mm -hmm. but how to get there. there, there obviously, there are going to be times where we have discussions and, and have different viewpoints. But mm -hmm. yeah, I have to work, walk through it and get to a place where we're both comfortable um, taking the cases that we're taking and, and moving forward. Yeah. Because, I mean, regardless of... Any firm you work with, you have limited resources. Yeah. You only have so many attorneys, so many paralegals. So many hours. So yeah. you can't take every single case that sure. that walks through the door. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, well, as, as we're kind of winding up and running out of time here, um, can you think about, and I don't know how, how in-depth you can speak about these things, but can you think about any any case that was just, that really sticks out as like the case of your career or something that, that was just absolutely magnificent that, that happened that you were trying or anything like that? Sure. I, they're, they're most, in my mind, it always goes to court. Sure. So I, we do a lot of things that aren't court, but that's where mm -hmm. I, I love litigation. So that's where I kind of go. So that there were, can't give a lot of details, right. but it was, it was a case in court that the judge ruled against us. Okay. We appealed it to the Board of Immigration Appeals. The board agreed, sent it back. Judge ruled against us again. Wow. So we went back up to the Board of Immigration Appeals on a wow. different issue and then sent it back down. They sent it back down to a different judge and then it was it was rectified. And wow, so it took three times. Took three times, took this. Wow, this how, how common is that with, within your industry? Um, being denied and going up is not, I wouldn't say completely uncommon, but yeah. having it happen two or three times is very unusual. Yeah, so, I can imagine so. And so it, but when, Getting back to core values, one of our core values is never give up. So right. we we keep fighting keep and going. fighting and fighting. <laughs> and so but eventually this gentleman it took ten years, but wow. this gentleman was able to to finally obtain his green card. And wow. So, that's insane. So that's, that's one that sticks in my head. The other one I, we've talked about before is the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. So can you can you explain that really fast, like very quickly sure. how how it all works? Because I know that Supreme is top, and then how right. does it go? And so yeah. it, right, so you have the Supreme Court, and then right below the Supreme Court, you have the Circuit Courts of Appeals. Okay, and so you have 
the, the first, second, third, all the way up to the, the 11th, mm -hmm. we're in the fourth. Wow. And so the fourth is covered in Virginia, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and I think Maryland's in there as well. And so... Is that for the whole country? That it's so, yeah, the country is broken into two circuits. Wow. It's interesting that it's all here, though. Like, you wouldn't expect that. You'd expect it to be, like, I don't know, in Chicago and New York. Yeah, I don't so, know, so Chicago like is, a, like, Chicago would be, I think, seventh circuit. Okay. And then gotcha. Ohio would be sixth circuit. So it, gotcha, gotcha, It's gotcha. broken gotcha. into okay. different circuits. Oh, okay, okay. I understand. And yeah. so... Um, That's why I asked. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have, yeah. The, you have the Supreme Court, then you have the circuit courts. Right. And for immigration, the way it would work is... You have the immigration court, then you have the Board of Immigration Appeals, then you can appeal up to a circuit court, then you can appeal up to the Supreme Court. Wow. And so, did have the opportunity to do oral arguments from the Fourth Circuit, which, that, that was incredible. That was yeah. How many people were in the room when you were doing that? In the say? room itself, probably 15 to 20. Okay. And so, you just have other attorneys waiting for their, their turn, but... Right. The way it works. Is it like a line of attorneys that just... No, they're, they're, okay, sitting, okay. they're sitting behind you. Okay, okay. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be kind yeah, of funny. Everybody's just, like just a... Yeah. One line going forward. There's a queue line, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, no, you get to to stand and, and go in front of the, ju the, the judges, which they're a panel of three. Right. And so, just what you you may have seen on TV. Yeah, I was you gonna start say, talking, yeah. they start interrupting, and you asking questions. And so, yeah. uh, that... For me, that was really in my element of being able to to be able to speak to the the justices and or the judges and answer the different questions that they had. So that was a have not been able to do that again. Yeah. When was that? What year was that? Well, that was it was after we merged. So my I'm thinking 2018. Mm -hmm. See, 2018 or 2019. Yeah. Man, I bet I bet that was I bet it was just like electric, you know, oh, just the experience because it was incredible. You know, that's that's really cool. Yeah. You were you were almost on TV. Almost, <laughs> almost here. That's it. That's it. Oh man, I bet that I I don't know I would I would I would thrive on that. Like that would be yeah. So, that that so was cool. incredible. That yeah. that was a great experience and just love being in that environment. Where yeah. Again, you're just being peppered with questions, you, and you have to know the the topics. Well enough I was to I was going to say you had to you had to know your your material exactly. like, like <laughs> perfectly almost. Yeah. Were you um it just and I mean it's been so long since now that you can you can reflect and answer this completely honestly. But you know, were you nervous going into it, or were you so confident in your in the material you knew that you that it didn't matter, or both? Both probably. Yeah. There there are some nerves. I had a incredible professor in law school and he actually made the comment is like if you're stepping into a court and you don't at least get a, a few butterflies mm -hmm. it's like you need to look at what you're doing right because there should be some level of excitement some level of reverence and respect and those types of things and so there should be at least an element of I wouldn't call it nerves but he called it butterflies yeah and so so I, I look at that as excitement so right yes I was very excited probably some of it was nerves as well but sure um, once you have a light there, once that light turns on, you can start speaking. You get the first five words out, that goes away. Yeah. Then you're just in your elements. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I would, I would love, I would love to be in that, in that zone, man. That's like, that's like the best zone to exist in, like where you just, you're just in that moment and nothing else. You know, it's just all there. Nothing else matters. You just know? focus straight ahead. On, right. On what the the judges are. Tunnel vision. Yeah. Like, oh man, that'd be great. Um, well, I think I believe we're out of time, Mercer. Can't wait to have lunch here. Um, we always like to sign off here with a with a little bit of a fun question. Um, sure. I think I think I have my fun question for you. I'll ask you okay. Plenty, <laughs> I, I'll ask you plenty more at lunch. So don't worry about that. But um, if you could try any case or any type of case, um, what case would that be and why? It, it go back to what we talked about before with the Fourth Circuit. Mm -hmm. Getting to that next level, I would I would love to be able to argue in front of the Supreme Court. At some no matter point. what it was, just being in that zone. Well, obviously, I'd want it to be immigration, right? Because that's um, what you know the best. Because sure. that's what yeah. I know. Sure. Uh, when I first got out of law school, before I went and all around the world, mm -hmm. I was planning on being a criminal law attorney and just being oh, criminal defense, you know, arguing that. So that was in the back of my head. Yeah. But um, was able to go through and uh, be sworn in mm -hmm. before the Supreme Court incredible experience and um it, it mostly just ceremonial at this point doesn't right. really mean anything because i haven't been able to argue yeah but i was able to do it and experience the supreme court sit in there have the justices up before you and then afterwards was able to meet um ruth gator 
Oh, Ginsburg, wow. Bader Ginsburg. And so that, that was just an amazing experience. I bet well. it was. And so, um, so yeah, so being able to argue from the Supreme Court and yeah. just really have that experience, that, I would love that. I oh, man. I, I love it. Do you keep up with any of the celebrity um, um, celebrity cases, like the Johnny Depp Amber, Amber Heard or anything like that? Or, or no, like no. the, uh, I, I was just wondering if you kept up with any of those, if you would, if you would like to take on a case like that or that size. Um, I keep up with celebrity cases, but more what's before the screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So not sure. celebrity as far as on TV yeah. and those types of things, but yeah. uh, watching what's happening in the Supreme Court, who's mm-hmm. arguing what the, those types of things, yeah. Yeah. What What's being handed down by the Supreme Court, so we stay on top of that. But. Yeah. Um, can you think of any any that went to the Supreme Court, uh, just subject material, it doesn't matter what the what the thing was, but any that you were like, oh, I wish I was doing that, like... Sure, there, there are some, especially relating to, to crimes. Mm-hmm. So, so, he unplugged it's myself. Just your, yeah, he unplugged it's myself just your headset, right. I can still hear you. So. <laughs> there we go. Yep. So, especially dealing with crimes, because if you commit a crime, the, the way it's looked at immigration is different than criminal law. So, okay. criminal law, you may be convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor. For immigration... They look at crimes in terms of an aggravated felony or a crime involving moral turpitude. And so having to argue that this criminal case fits into this immigration case in this particular manner. So arguing those types of things for the Supreme Court would, yes, absolutely be a lot of fun to say yeah. that, well, I should say fun, but well, I, no, would I, get enjoy, what you're saying, I would enjoy it. Be exhilarating. Is, <laughs> is having the, the experience and the opportunity to argue that this particular crime does not fit what immigration was intending. And so mm-hmm. you should not be keeping this for a person from being able to, to pursue an opportunity here with their family. Right. And so, so looking at those types of opportunities. That, in, in today's terms, is called crimmigration. Crimmigration. <laughs> nice. 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 Yeah. Criminal law and immigration. But so some of those would be, it would be a lot. Yeah. Of, of, there'd be a lot into it and a lot that I would enjoy taking that those types of arguments to the Supreme Court. So yeah. So sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll see on TV soon. Um, and for all, for all of our listeners, what Mercer secretly said there is that he would have loved to have been OJ's attorney. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. That, yeah, secretly in the back. Of secretly. That's where it was. That's it. That's it. All right, man. Let's have lunch. Talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks.